私は明星大学の笠原頼道と言います教育学部の教員ですここはですね明星大学の資料図書館にございます基調書閲覧室というところですこちらの壁の後ろ側に書館がございましてその中に基調書がたくさん所蔵されておりますその中の一番のお宝がですねシェイクスピアのファーストフォリオというものです1623年に出版されたシェイクスピアの戯曲の全集なんですけれどもそれを使ってイギリスのドゥモンフォート・ユニバーシティの先生および学生さんが授業の一環としてここで研究をなさっていらっしゃいますその様子をですね直接リサーチをしている皆さんに伺ってみたいと思います Hello,、uh, my name is Kasahara Yorimichi of Meisei University uh, We're now at the,、uh, the rare book reading room of Meisei University Research Library. Now, behind this wall、uh, are stacks of、uh, bookshelves,、uh, where the, one of the most important treasures, the first folio of Shakespeare, is kept. And now, uh, uh, some of the、uh, students from De Montfort University in the UK. Are visiting、uh, Mesa University to make a research on those books. So,、uh, shall we ask them to、uh, introduce what they have found? Hello, so here we are、uh, at the、uh, rare book reading room of Mesa University Library. My name is Kasahara,、uh, teaching English language and literature at the Faculty of Education at Mesa University. And with me over there is Professor Sumimoto, who is the only Shakespearean scholar at Meisei University. Would you like to say just hello? Hello, my name is Sumimoto, and I'm teaching、uh, Shakespeare in International、uh, Studies Department. All right, and then、uh, with me here is、uh, Dr. Paul Brown from De Montfort University with his students. Would you like to, to say a few words? Uh, what you're here for, and then、uh, introduce your students. Thank you. Yes,、yeah, so I'm、uh, Paul Brown from the English department. I'm a tutor in the English department at De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK. And I'm here with my students looking particularly at the Shakespeare first folio that m a y s a y has、uh, a good number of copies of.、Um, we are, or the students are, In part of a course、uh, about the technologies of text involved with the two big textual revolutions、uh, that is, the shift from manuscript text to early modern print, printing with movable type, the, the, the printing press of Johannes Gutenberg, and the second big revolution that moved from the printing press to digital text, the text we're familiar with on computers. For this part、uh, of the module or this, this trip helps us learning about. Movable type, printing with movable type. In particular, we're interested in the first folio、um, because of its、uh, provenance in、uh, Shakespeare studies and English literature generally, the position it has,、um, and also because within the extant copies,、uh, there are many, many observable variants created at the time of printing. And the students have been here over the last week looking at these books, trying to detect some of these variants and learning more about the process of printing and、uh, our reception of Shakespeare's text off the back of it. And we're going to talk in some detail about a few examples they've seen in a bit, but right now I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves.、Uh, hello, my name is Elijah, I'm a student at DMU. Hello, I'm Kira McEvely, I'm a student at DMU. Hi, I'm Marley Riddell, and I'm also a student at DMU. Hi, I'm Charlotte Sperling, and I'm also a student at DMU. Thank you very much. So,、uh, shall we go、uh, and look at the folios to see what they have found? Great. Good. Before going into the details of the workshop, I think we need to make some basic terms clear. They are sheet, leaf, and page. Let me explain 
using the illustration which uh, Folger Shakespeare Library gives on their website. Well, basically, these words are used not much differently from a daily use. That is, if you fold a sheet of paper once, you get two leaves or four pages. It's simple as that. In addition, we also use a pair of words meaning front and back. The front side of a leaf is called recto, and the back side verso. So, if you open a folded sheet, what's on your left-hand side is the verso, and what comes on your right is the recto. Now, in order to make a book, we need to print many sheets, fold them, put them together, and bind them. We use the word gathering to mean a collection of folded sheets. We also need to designate them somehow so that they are placed in the correct order. For this purpose, signatures are placed at the bottom of each page. Now, if you put, for instance, three sheets together, like this illustration, this entire gathering would be a gathering, and page one would, theoretically, bear the signature A1 recto, page two A1 verso, and page three A2 recto, and so forth, till we come to A6 verso. This is how each page is labelled. As for other terms, Dr. Brown and his student will explain. They will also touch upon some irregularities of this sequence, whether or not we all go through this, what appears to be a redundant process of uh, labelling each page, and why it's important to pay attention to this system of pagination. So, one of the first things uh, we did was consider how the, as well as how the book had been printed, how it was then put together into uh, what we now know as the first folio. And we looked at this in direct comparison with the way a quarto text was put together. These were the two predominant formats of book in the early modern period, the quarto and the folio. A quarto, as its name suggests, is a sheet of paper printed, folded twice, that produces four leaves, eight pages. A folio sheet is folded once, produces two leaves, four pages. Okay, so uh, will you uh, tell us what you found out uh, with um, this folio? So during our sessions with the first folio, we noticed the signatures that were at the bottom of each page mm -hmm. on the side, but within each folio there are several gatherings, or many gatherings, and each one will have a signature. But we began to notice as we went throughout the folio that only the first three signatures were common in the gathering because they would become implied as it went on. So the first letter would signify which gathering it was, and then after that they would, begin, they would have a number which would then signify which leaf it was. And then, as you can see, there will not be any sign like any indication that it is the recto or the verso of the page, because this would be implied, because the gatherings would be printed in forms. So on the inner form, it would be printed the second page and the third page, and the outer form would be printed with the first and the fourth page. And then these would be put together, and they would and it would then be implied because all the pages would still be attached when put together in the folio. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at the way that the, these gatherings, one sheet, folded, either for a quarto or for a folio, we looked at the way these had been put together and what this told us about the printing of the book. As Kira rightly said, 
after the preliminaries, once we hit the main text of the book, these are labelled initially A, B, C, D. So each folio gathering is labelled with a capital letter. Once we hit Z, it changes, and we notice that there became much less regularity um, with the, the way that the gatherings were signed. But with the ones that we were looking at, we described them, as is, as is convention, as a folio in sixes, because each folio sheet was paired with another two sheets, one inserted inside another, inserted inside another, at the fold to form that particular gathering. So as Kira was talking there, she was talking about having six leaves, three of which were signed because the fourth, fifth and sixth were still attached to the first three, so we could work out their orders. And this became particularly important, this knowledge became particularly important when we started looking at error in the first folio or perceived uh, what we perceived as error or uh, just difference across the surviving exemplars because we were interested in seeing whether we had in front of us a corrected or an uncorrected state and being able to understand how the book was put together allowed us to check the right pages, as uh, Kira used the, the term there, folio mates, we were able to see uh, which part, which uh, pages had been in the form in the press together and be, begin working backwards to help build up our hypotheses about the changes we were seeing. Hmm. Thank you very much. はい。そうですね。フォリオ、あの、え、全部あの、表、表側って言うんですか。こちら側をレクトと言って、こちらはバースと言うんですけれども、あの、レクトの、え、頭のところに、え、ちょっとそれを見せてもらいましょうか。ここですとC B のところでやってくださったんですけどね。で、その積んで、え、折るのかっていうことがあの、わかるからですね。あの、最小限だけ書いてあるということですね。面白いですね。Thank you very much. Uh, can you perhaps tell us uh, what you can find out through those uh, com comparisons with those uh, signatures? Um, so sometimes we've been able to find out if with the signatures if any pages may be missing mm -hmm. because as they are attached if say one of the first three is mm -hmm. missing and there is not a correct amount mm -hmm. until the next gathering mm -hmm. um, we can then indicate that one has maybe fallen um, fallen apart or has been damaged and removed or another leaf has then been replaced mm -hmm. with it. So you mean to say that uh, by comparing those uh, signatures on each page uh, we can uh, uh, fairly clearly uh, visualize the exact process of uh, printing and folding paper and yes. things like that. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, will you tell us what you found out uh, during this workshop? Uh, during our second workshop, uh, we found that there's actually a bullet hole in the Maze A11. Uh, and according to Rasmussen and West, uh, it starts 
in the first original page of A6 and, th and goes on until CC3. However, we found that this isn't actually true, because if we go to CC3, uh, there is no visible uh, bullet holes or any marks whatsoever that, need, that needs to have been repaired. However, if we found that it only goes up to the uh, K3. Where you can see, you can see on the page beforehand that there's only a slight indentation. So we can see that it finally stops at K3, proving that Rasmussen and West are not actually correct on this matter. Um, that's well, that's a great discovery, isn't it? So, would you like to make a comment on it? Sure. So, what we were doing here was cross-referencing the pre-existing knowledge uh, that had been compiled by Rasmussen and West in their descriptive catalogue of the, the Shakespeare First Folios. And this is the go-to resource for people interested in the First Folios, people who can't be lucky enough to come to Mesa and use the books themselves. And so we were cross-referencing uh, some of their claims against uh, what we could uh, establish about the books as a way of learning about them. And because of the interest of having a, a bullet hole unique to Mesa 11's, uh, the, the Mesa 11 folio, uh, we thought we would have a look. And we were able to go page by page and see uh, the repairs being made uh, to the book that Elijah rightly said began with one of the preliminary gatherings and carry on through the contents page. Uh, and you can see it's really well uh, repaired actually, but you can keep seeing the mark. So the students were able to track the repairs as they go through, getting slightly fainter and fainter. And by applying their, the knowledge of how a folio is put together and their knowledge of page signatures, that is how they are, how we tell the order of the pages and where, where things are, uh, they were able to work out that somewhere in the K gathering we stopped seeing the repairs, the bullet didn't travel any further, and that for a good number of gatherings before the CC gathering claimed by Rasmussen and West, there's no marker of, uh, of a bullet. So they put their new skills to test uh, some of Rasmussen and West's claims, and on this one we think we found uh, yeah, an error that they are able to correct by studying the book first hand. Thank you very much. すみません、先生。今のちょっとご説明いただけますか。そうですね。あの、世界中のフォリオは一冊ずつ皆あの実際にこう調べ見て調べてそして記録した本というのがあるわけなのですけれどもあのその記録と実際にあの現物と言います
Yes, um, so we looked at some of the discrepancies in the words and the lettering. Mm -hmm. um, when looking at this text, um, we found that there's a word at the top that seems to be complain. Um, in this one, it's complain it. Mm -hmm. um, because of obviously old English language, we couldn't decide which one was the actually correct word. Mm. Um, so we continued to investigate the rest of the page. And we found here there was an and with a full stop mm -hmm. in the middle of the sentence, which doesn't seem to be correct. So mm -hmm. we had to look at this one and found that this one has a character's name, um, which is the Anne for Andronicus, which would make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we decided to continue investigating. Um, and we then came to... Um, A B N T here, which we actually decided we thought that the B U T for but was the correct word. Um, so we looked into the B N T to decide whether the N was actually an upside down U mm -hmm. and it had just been misplaced, or if it was in fact an N that possibly sipped into the U on the type case um, with redistribution. Mm -hmm. um, However, although we've decided that we think this is the corrected one, there are still some elements, such as the raised question mark up here, um, which leaves a bit of uncertainty still. <laughs> <laughs> so, what can you say with these uh, findings? So, the great thing here that we were able to do at Maysay is have two folios side by side to have the students work with. So rather than just one, or one in fact simile, as you might have at other research libraries, here, we have, in fact we had three while we were doing this exercise. And we were interested in working out which, if any, uh, of the books in front of us were in a corrected state. That is, they began to be, begun to be printed, and someone in the print shop had decided that there was uh, an error or something in them that needed to be changed. And they'd made that change during the print run. And some of the pages already printed were kept uh, with that error or that, that uh, change or not yet made. And some were then printed with the change made or with an error corrected. I'm being very cautious about attributing error uh, because there's a lot of debate that goes back and forth about uh, what just indeed what is the nature of uh, an error and who might have uh, introduced it um, but certainly uh, change so with these two folios we were able to see both states or two different states um, of these changes and by assessing these changes we were able to build up a case we thought with multiple data points for the direction of change the, which which was what is generally termed the corrected state and which was the uncorrected. And we roughly, I think, agreed that may say 1 was the uncorrected state and may say 11 was in a corrected state. And had we wanted to further confirm this, we could have looked at other pages in the book. And indeed, we, we did in later sessions, and it did confirm our findings. Um, it was particularly interesting um, because the students here were able to apply practical knowledge. So back at de Montfort, when they're at home, they learn how to compose type using movable typepieces and print on a printing press uh, as part of their project on the module. And they have seen firsthand how fiddly it can be, how difficult it can be to take the right piece of type at any one time, and how easy it is to transpose a piece of type, turn it upside down, as we see with the but having the B or the U uh, turned the wrong way. The final thing, which was another excellent thing for the students to see, is that it's not all one-way traffic. All of the evidence doesn't fit one way. What I mean is we wouldn't expect to find a corrected state with a floating <laughs> question mark above the line. Um, but clearly, and it was important to learn this, uh, that sometimes type moves around, uh, even in correction. Sometimes a correction introduces other errors and other complications. So it's really good 
um, to be able to see this and to have multiple folios to help corroborate theories. Mm, thank you very much. その、直す前のものも直しが終わった後のものも擦れたものは全部等しく正因の中にあの組み込まれてきましたのでこういうふうに同じフォリオなんですけれどもあの違った状態違ったあのスペリングのものがこう混在しているっていう状態になっていますそれであ
the, the idea that there's something dramatic going on, that it's a deliberate choice to have this repetition. Um, I was leaning more towards arguments that something perhaps has gone wrong in the print shop to see this, uh, to see this appear, uh, where we've got a speech, not uh, one line perfectly repeated uh, from women's... Yes, so the first line, from women's eyes, this doctrine I derive. Yes, is perfectly repeated, but then two following lines, one regarding Promethean fire, one regarding arts, books and the academy, uh, are slightly differently repeated, but the content is more or less the same. And as Charlie uh, well outlined, we were debating various reasons for this, casting ourselves in the position of editor. Were we to be editing these texts for a modern reader, what would we do, do we, would, and how would we attribute the, um, the differences and we ran through, as she suggested, a range of hypotheses uh, to try and establish or try and determine uh, what was going on and we found we were inconclusive, uh, they were still ambiguous so we didn't, um, we didn't nail one down, we weren't certain about anything. We thought had we uh, more time and certainly um, perhaps outside the research library when we're not uh, just working with the folios that we could look at um, modern editions to see what modern editors have done and whether they offer footnotes to their thinking that might help shape our understanding. But also to go backwards a little bit and look at the first printed text of Love's Labour's Lost, which is a quarto from 1598, and compare the speech of Barone there to see whether, uh, whether the same uh, distinction was preserved and we might dive into the ideas of the manuscript copy behind the folio and the quarto text and whether people think they were the, they were the same. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the instructive point here is that we were left without a certain answer despite uh, being able to make plausible hypotheses based on our learning about early modern print. Mm. Uh, Love State of Lost was uh, first printed uh, uh, as a quarto uh, yeah. a f few years before yeah, so uh, the 15, first volume. Yes, 1598 mm -hmm. was the first quarto, um, and 1623 was mm -hmm. the first, first. And your finding uh, doesn't uh, go against the supposition we had before with the uh, Titus Andronicus, uh, uh, meaning that this may say 1 is older than this uh, may say 11. It doesn't go against it. It doesn't go against it because um, the same repetition has occurred. Mm -hmm. There's, there is no difference between what is written in section A and section B in um, this one, uh, mm -hmm. this folio to this folio. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Charlie, you're quite right. The idea that um, we have in May say one an uncorrected state and in May say eleven a corrected state, um, it suggests that it. it hasn't been picked up as a glaring mm. error or an error that's mm. been noticed in the print shop, which would um, add weight to Charlie and the other students' position that perhaps this is meant to be, the, the, this repetition is meant to stay uh, yeah. in the speech. It could simply be that it was missed um, in after or during correction. Mm. Um, and we've seen plenty of examples of that over the last few days as well. Mm. But it's, yeah, something else to bear in mind when we no, argue back and forth about this. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it seems that you have, uh, uh, well, lit us with the Promethean fire, <laughs> and so that we all are quite eager to look more deep into, uh, into the differences and variants uh, between folios and other things. Thank you very much, and thank you all. Mm. Well, the first thing I would like to say is uh, a very big thank you to our hosts at Mesa University. Um, in the International Studies Centre and in the Rare Books Room of the Memorial Library. Um, they really have provided a, a rare opportunity uh, for me and for our students to work with uh, these first folios. These really are texts that only a privileged few uh, ever get to handle um, and work with. And so we do consider it a real privilege to have had that chance that privilege is translated into some extraordinary learning on behalf of our students. It's all very well for me to stand in a classroom and tell them about press variants in 
folios and explain to them about inner and outer forms, folios in sixes, gathering signatures. Um, but it's another thing altogether for them to come and be able to experience it in multiple texts and see their learning join up, see some of those things come together uh, in, in looking at these books, trying to ascertain which are in corrected or uncorrected states, for example, trying to hypothesise why something happened with running headers that sees the numbering change uh, and why that numbering is kept and preserved in the contents page, why other plays aren't listed in the contents page, why some of the signatures uh, in the latter parts of the book don't follow the neat order that they followed in the first part of the book. All of these questions that I might have posed in a classroom session at home uh, would have been abstract um, and very difficult for students to encounter and certainly not uh, and, and work through and they certainly wouldn't have been able to do it on a practical level and so coming here I've noticed that our students have uh, been able to offer much more in terms of their um, supposition or their uh, hypotheses about the various things uh, that we've seen in these uh, folios. So as well as it being simply a, a brilliant book for people to experience, so, you know, lovers of literature generally and students of, of Shakespeare, um, and it being rare in, it, in sort of its truest sense and only a couple of hundred uh, extant copies surviving. It's also been a quite unbelievable teaching tool and one that I'm very grateful to Mace uh, for allowing us to, to use. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm very glad to know that uh, you and your students uh, did have a very good time with the folios. And uh, well, uh, beyond doubt that uh, the Shakespeare's folios is our greatest treasure. Uh, but far more greater treasure is that there are some people who really make use of uh, those treasures. Thank you very much for coming over and I hope uh, you will uh, further uh, continue your research with the folios, whether with Meisei or without Meisei. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. ドゥモフォートユニバーシティの学生さんおよび先生方がこうやって実際に明星大学の基調書を使ってですねリサーチをされてそれなりに実り豊かな成果を得られたということとても明星大学の教員として嬉しく思っております何よりも嬉しいのはですねこうしたあのシェイクスピアのファーストフォリオというのは明星大学の持っている非常に貴重な宝なんですけれどもそうしたですね宝を実際に使ってリサーチをしている人がいるとそういう人の役に立てるということはもっと大きな宝というふうに私は思っておりますどうもありがとうございましたいかがでございましたでしょうかドゥモンフォーティニバーシティの皆さんが1週間にわたって明星大学の基調書を使ってリサーチをされましたそれぞれ非常にいろいろな発見をされたようでえー、そのファーストフォリオを持っている明星大学としても大変誇りに思っております、えー、皆さんがそれぞれさらに今回見つけたいろいろなことをですねご自身の研究に生かせていかれることを心から祈っております。